Okay, this, this talk is the lost art of database design. Hello, I'm not Matt Jankovic. Uh, I'm not the host has head of open source strategy at Pecona, uh, uh, but you can find Matt at M. Uh, Jankovic uh, and check his great podcast. He was the guy who had to make this presentation, but uh, for personal reasons, he could not attend the conference this year. We miss him a lot. And this is me, this is Pepla. Um, I've been working uh, with databases for a long time. Uh, I live uh, in Barcelona. I guess you know I love going to the beach. And um, uh, I have a particular sense of humor. Well, uh, one, one of the problems with databases is that, that they are not for me, they are quite sexy for me, but usually they are not sexy for the vast majority of developers. Databases are like something you have to deal with, but it's uh, pretty much like a infrastructure thing that is there. It's like the walls or something. You don't care very much about them. And they are not cool. I mean, you, you this is a database conference, so here is uh, uh, cool, but if, if you look at, for example, the requests or what uh, people is looking for when they try to hire a, a, a developer, usually databases are not, knowledge about databases is not a requirement. They, they ask about technologies, they ask about programming languages, they ask about, uh, you know, are you willing to travel, but they never say, do you know uh, about database design? Do you know about, uh, What's the behavior of a database? So in, in general, it's not um, a cool uh, topic. This is something you study maybe uh, at the university, and that's it. Okay? So not a lot of people care about database design. And who, who, who really is uh, uh, aware of that? Well, the, the sellers, the vendors, they try to um, introduce you a lot of concepts, a lot of um, buzzwords. So for example, schema, schema list databases, okay? Uh, ORMs, you don't need to write, to write SQL, you don't need to worry about how things are stored, you just say, okay, uh, it's an object, and all the methods and all, everything will be generated. You have APIs to access data, don't worry what's beneath, okay? Let's super natively JSON and let's put everything uh, inside of a JSON. Database as a service, which by the way is a, a really interesting concept, but uh, as long as you understand that uh, the service gives you what you ask the service to do. Okay, so if you ask uh, database as a service uh, product something stupid, he happily will give you something stupid. Okay, so you have to worry about the application, but obviously the database is part of the application. So you have to worry also about the database. Things like, you know, autonomous databases, there's a lot of, and, and every season you have it's like a uh, fashion thing. So this season, let's talk about the schema less, maybe next year, who cares? So the, the thing is that uh, vendors try to sell you uh, um, uh, the stuff, and sometimes you should not buy, and this includes also uh, Percona or me as a consultant, sometimes you should not buy what, you, what, what I'm trying to, let's say, sell. What I mean is that you need to have your own criteria. You need to take everything that uh, we as speakers or vendors say and say, okay, does it make sense? Does it fit my, um, my company? Does it fit my application? Does it fit my requirements? Um, because otherwise, what you are doing is a fallacy of confirmation. 
because I will tell you what you want to hear. Okay? So it's very dangerous because you, for example, attend a conference and say, oh, this technology is really cool. And I'll tell you that it's really cool. And you say, oh, I thought it was really cool. And that smart guy told me it's really cool. So oh, it's really cool. Okay? So you need to analyze. And the fact is that the taste design is a little bit like designing the plumbing for your house. It's something that you don't want to do. It's like, I don't know. It, you take it for granted. It's, and it must be easy. It's like, well, let's do, uh, uh, don't care. OK? And the problem is that sometimes <laughs> it curs a lot. And when it curs, it's a huge, it's a massive problem. You are like, uh, you know, here. <laughs> so, um, and when you discover this, is almost a disaster because your house is already built. And changing the plumbing once your house is built is extremely expensive and can be extremely costly. Not only in terms of money, but in terms of doing things that you like to do. So if you are a developer, you don't want to rebuild the application. You don't want to say, OK, I made a mistake, and now I need to convince my management that we need to invest time and resources fixing something that I made wrong. And the, we always make mistakes. And when you design about the database, you will make mistakes. But if you make the mistake because you consider that it was not important, then you have a problem. Okay. So database design matters. Uh, better database designs leads to better performance, less space, and less space leads to better performance because at the end of the day, if you have to access one gigabyte, it's faster than accessing 10 gigabytes, <coughs> okay? And you use less memory, it gives you better security because you have the confidence of redundancy without taking care too much about price. We all have seen clients that have a huge, massive database, and the database is that big that they have to make compromises when they make backups. And instead of making a daily backup, they do a weekly backup, just because the backup takes more than one day. Okay? And then if you have a problem, you are losing five days of data or six days of data because usually shit happens and the system goes down or the disk crashes just 10 minutes before the next backup. So <laughs> you are going to lose uh, a, a lot of data. So <clears throat> on the long term, all these things lower costs. It also makes easier releasing new software, but not only in terms of upgrading the, to a new uh, database version because you have to check a smaller database. It also makes easier running online changes, for example. So if you have to alter a table and the set of data is smaller or it's well designed, things will be really very fast. For example, uh, we, I'm seeing very often things like tables that contain live, live data and historical data together. And you have three terabytes of data where the data that you're really working maybe is 100 gigabytes. And the other one is historical data. When you have to create an index on a table like this, it's a nightmare that takes a few days, 
it can require downtime, you need to do it in a replica and then perform a failover. So it makes the whole operation quite complex. While if you have a historical table and a live table and from time to time move data from one table to the other, creating the index on the live table is quite quick. And at the same time, maybe you don't need that index on the historical data because the, ac the, the access patterns for historical data and for um, uh, uh, live data are different. Okay? And at the end of the day, this translates on a better experience for the users. And if the user is happy, the developer is happy, uh, less incidents uh, during Saturdays and things like that. So about the database design, the, th the five uh, most basic things to do to consider we will uh, find uh, at the end of this talk. This talk sometimes is, is a bit like, you know, like Captain Obvious. Okay, it's like uh, I'm saying things that, well, we, we start this at, at the university, or it's like a trivial thing. But the problem with the obvious things is that sometimes are so obvious that you don't see them. Sometimes somebody comes with an idea and you say, oh, it sounds good, it makes sense, but just because you don't sit and during half a minute think it's not a good idea. And then try to prove yourself that uh, 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 what you initially believed it was a good idea, it is not. And then sometimes you say, oh, really, it, is it was not a good idea. Okay? Uh, so the, the, the right uh, design I involves considering a lot of, uh, of different points. For example, should I have all the data in the same database? And this is a really broad question because it can be in the same database technology, in the same physical server, I can have the historical data in a in different server. So in case of an incident, I don't need to restore the historical data. Because for example, one, one thing that is really very disappointing is if you have to recover a backup and realize that re restoring the backup takes one day, but 20 hours are restoring all data. Okay. Even sometimes uh, it makes sense to have different uh, databases inside of the same database instance to help uh, uh, things like uh, uh, parallel replication, the old way used to, to write in, in, in different uh, tables, but it also can help you when you want to split and uh, 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 separate those, those databases into different servers if they are located in, in uh, different databases, you can maybe use some technology that allows you uh, to split the load, okay? A proxy in the middle or things like that. You need to understand the, the, the pros and cons of uh, all the, the, the design decisions you take. And you need to think what the, the workload uh, uh, your application uh, will experience. And we are talking for about something that happens before writing the application. So almost all of us know the workloads of our databases now. Okay? But when the, uh, the, we start developing the application, sometimes we don't know the workload. We need to make a guess. We need to speak with uh, business. We need to speak with our clients to ask them what are the access uh, workloads? What are the, the what should we expect uh, that uh, is is the 
the, the expected workload, work, sorry, workload for the database. And this is pretty much the same with growth and access patterns, okay? And a schema, a schema and, and design matters uh, because, for example, if you use the right data types, you will um, have much more optimal utilization of storage. And this will transform in a better overall performance just because if you manage to fit more rows in less space, you will retrieve more data on each uh, disk access. It's that simple. Uh, and also, don't overthink. Uh, at the same time, sometimes we try to be so clever that we design things that is, oh, I'm really good. And I'm really good, but this is really complicated. To maintain this code, it will cost a lot. So this is maybe a really clever solution for something very specific, but it's not the right thing to do. Okay, smart. Uh, I've s seen, for example, sometimes. Um, no, th there's an access pattern. Is when you do a join with the same table. Usually it's like, oof. No, you should do something uh, 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 different. You are joining data. You have internal relationships in the same table. Oof, oof. Because this is very hard to process at the end of the day. This does not mean that you never should do this. It means that very often if you do this, it's because uh, you are overcomplicating things. Um, so also very important, you need to create the right indexes. Uh, how is you need to know how data is accessed, how frequent, and you need to tweak this actively. And with indexes, it's also there's something very important is you need to create indexes, but you don't need to create too many indexes. So having too many indexes can be also a problem because the optimizer, for example, needs to decide which index to use. And if you have two indexes that more or less are the same or even are the same, but the statistics for the indexes are not exactly the same for whatever reason, the optimizer will be a little bit crazy about this. Okay? It will probably choose the correct one, but sometimes it can choose the wrong one. And also, the more indexes you have, the more uh, index dives, the more things you need to do to decide the right execution plan. That's a great point, because like so many people, when they think about indexes, having too many, everybody, their first go-to thought about it is the overhead for the writes. But actually, you bring up an awesome point. The reads are just as important. Yes, you, you can make the life of the optimizer harder. So. Yeah, so the optimizer is going to take longer to decide you know, the explain plan, looking at the stats and looking at everything. So it's a great point. So it's schemaless. Uh, I, I love this slide uh, because uh, uh, actually some uh, this year I tried to get the a whole book and it's almost impossible because they are no longer printed, at least in, in Spain. So uh, just I wanted for a course uh, uh, that I made in, at my son's school, uh, because sometimes they ask, what's your job? And I was trying to explain about databases, and I think a phone book is a great uh, uh, explanation of a structure of data, and the yellow pages are a great, great explanation of in theory, schema-less data. I say in theory because you see, usually you had the, the, the big uh, advertising with pictures, and then you say, okay, uh, this is schema-less because I 
kind of store images. And this is the, the main purpose of, of schema list, being able to store everything. But this is not true. The main purpose of yellow pages is this. It's finding the phone number. It's not looking at the picture. The picture is important because it may attract you. But the real information is here, and it's not schemaless. Okay? And you need to be able to find and manage this information quickly. So sometimes it's not about being able to store schemaless information. It's about what can you do with this schemaless information. And the fact is that. Uh, we are talking about an unstructured data storage that it's really very flexible, but when we have to deal with, with this storage, we need a lot more performance uh, involved. We need much more processing power, which, you know, hardware is cheap. We all heard hardware is cheap until somebody has to pay AWS uh, invoices or has to buy the hardware and to pay the, the collocation and to pay the hosting and to pay everything. And then it's not that cheap. It costs a lot of money and it's a recurrent expense. You have to pay it every month. So it's not true it's cheap. It's expensive. And it's always growing because the data grows. So if you have something that you can deal with it's in uh, on structure, but it fits in the memory of the <coughs> server, and more or less you can deal with it, that's fine. But this is not going to last forever. Sooner or later, you will have more data than memory. Or you will have to buy a bigger server. So in any case, uh, you will have to do uh, uh, something to fix a, a, a wrong decision. And the fact is that even those who say, OK, schema is great, they say, it's great, and I, yes, it's great, but do some uh, schema validation and also apply some rules to your data. Okay? So it's like schema but not too much. Okay? And this uh, usually is related to more or less the space. Okay. The, as I said, uh, the, the more complex you uh, store your data, the more space is needed. Usually, complexity storing data means that uh, uh, you will need more space to store that. Okay. So, and well, that, that's fine. I have a database. It's complex. I have interactions there. It's, I have images and everything in, in the database. But then I need a replica, and I need to make backups. And actually, I need some working space, because when I want to create an index, I need a space to have twice the table. Okay. So, um, and I need temporary storage, and I need uh, a database for DB Lohman, and I would like to have a test environment with the same amount of data than, than production just to test everything. So, it may sound a bit crazy, but 10 times the size of the database is not that crazy. So if you make a wrong uh, design that uses a lot of storage, it will cost you money. Fixing uh, storage, we've seen cases uh, reaching up to a 43% cost reduction. And this is an, an specific case. Obviously, it depends. In some cases, you will uh, be able even to, to save more. And in some cases, maybe you will just uh, save a, a, little, a little bit. So uh, there's a, a story that Matt also always explains. 
about uh, a large uh, social media company that used the email as primary key. Okay. The problem is that that's fine. I have the email as primary key. I can find uh, people by email address. Uh, but the way I know DB works is that the primary key is part of all the secondary indexes. And if there's a relationship between two tables, you need to use that email address also. So in, if you have an index in the secondary table, you will have again that, that email address. So the, the, the fact is that uh, the, that poor design uh, lead to using a lot uh, of, of storage. And uh, character fields are not really good for, for primary keys. So what we did was changing the, the, the email. And what we did not try. Uh, what we did was adding a column that was a CRC32 of the email address and then changing to um, the, the primary key to the, that uh, CRC. And then changing all the relationships. So by adding a column, we reduce the space. Okay? And this made uh, the system overall faster just because of this. Data types, if we store one, two, three, four, five, six, my password, uh, and we have 100 million data points, these are the differences. And you say, ah, come on. You don't store numeric values in a character uh, a column. Usually, you don't do that. But maybe you store character data that could be a numeric value. Okay, so uh, that's an example we will see later in the presentation. But there are only 199 countries in the world. So why are you storing the country as a character with the full text of the country? And we see these kind of things. Example I was talking about. Also, sometimes we don't use the right uh, uh, data type for the right data. We tend to uh, write character data, but which is just in the ASCII part. It's seven bits in UTF columns. Okay. So we are overusing a lot of storage just because we do this. Okay. You need to think also about the access patterns. This is a very nice slide. You know. um, and this means that you need to understand how is your data be accessed. And also very important, how these access patterns change in time, how, and how these access patterns change depending on the application component. Because I've seen very often, for example, uh, uh, web companies that use the same data model for uh, analytics and for the web. And the access patterns are completely different. And from time to time, you know, I have a replica that is used for reporting purposes. And that replica has exactly the same data model than the front end web. While the access patterns are completely different. So once you have a replica, maybe you should try to have a process that converts the data into a format that is good for reporting. Because, for example, 
it has pre-calculated data. I've seen sometimes, you know, we have the weekly uh, sales report. And the weekly sales report calculates the sales for the whole, the last seven days. And every time we run it, it's about five times every day, we calculate the sales for the last seven days. This means that I'm calculating five times a day the sales of yesterday, which by the way, unless you have a time machine, will not change. And the same for the, <laughs> the other day, and the other day, and the other day. And we're running this five times every day. And th this kind of access patterns are, are quite common and are easily optimized. Uh, you can optimize them uh, very easily. Indexes. Again, the access patterns. How often, when, which are the most common access patterns. And store data and index in the most relevant ways. It's n not a common feature, but some uh, uh, database technologies allow you to create different types of indexes. And different types of indexes means that you can um, get benefits depending on your, your access pattern. It's not the same an index scan that are direct um, access for a column, for a row, sorry. And also important, you have to review this because Applications, companies, markets are uh, like beings that change, okay? So maybe when you design your application, your company was local, and then you had indexes uh, based on a distribution pattern of your customers that has changed just because now you are present in three countries more, and then some information like, for example, the IDs of, of, of people has a different format. And this means that we have clusters of data. Okay. Don't be an idiot. <laughs> well, the thing is that by doing this, this presentation, sometimes it looks like we are saying everything is really very complicated. No, no, everything is not really very complicated. The purpose of this presentation is everything is simple or not. You have to discover if it's simple or not. And if you have two options, always choose the simplest one, okay? Don't design and build for the edge cases. Design for the common case and treat the exceptions, okay? Make the hard job treating the exception, and the, the easy job is the, 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 the usual case. And don't overthink, or at least don't overthink too much, because, you know, f flexibility can be uh, really good, but it can be really bad if you're a bridge, for example, being too flexible is, is a, a big problem. And um, that's also a, a case of a, a survey company that uh, somebody who was really very smart decided that uh, the demographics of people were to be classified using a big map. So, uh, it was two bits for gender, seven bits for state, three bits for educational level. This means that, well, if you look for gender, it's quite fast because it, all the, the uh, records are together. But if you look for educational level, then they are all scattered and you can't create an index. Well, now you could try to create a functional index, but it would be really very complicated. But if you index this column, and you just want to know the data for the educational level, you can do a full scan. Okay. Don't be an idiot part two. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I like this quote. Think about how stupid the average person is and then realize that half of them are stupider than that. So, uh, 
database companies spend millions of dollars developing tech. So you need to know the technology you are working with, with and try to avoid doing the same in your application that the technology uh, provides. Okay. okay, but at the same time, don't try to implement every single feature. Don't say, okay, this is really cool. I need to, I need to create a table with this type of index, <laughs> okay? So, because th this also happens very often, you think, oh, I would like to do, there's a new feature for online creation of indexes. Let's create an index. No, 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 don't do that, okay? Uh, there was a, a, a company that uh, decided that why are you going to use joins at the database level when you can have a Java program that scans the both tables, place them in memory, and they does the join. Well, don't don't do that. <laughs> don't be an idiot. Uh, use the right uh, database. Don't force your application and data into something that does not fit. When I said the schema list does not exist, actually, there is some sort of schema list data, uh, always. For example, logs and things like that, that you just want to keep for the record, but you are not going to explode and do complex queries, and maybe you just want to look at a certain range of dates, so you want to keep the whole uh, Java um, stack trace thing and you don't want to build a parser and say, okay, usually my Java messages have, no, you just write the in, in one field and then you keep the source and maybe two or three uh, 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 more columns with, with significant information. What I mean is, don't uh, try to use the tool you know uh, to do something. You need to use the right tool to do something. And if you don't know the tool, learn how to use it. You will be better and you will uh, know more things. Don't think uh, that uh, just because you know that tool, it's the perfect tool for everything. The data access and uh, uh, usage. Keep in mind, just in case design is bad, what I said, uh, do uh, the a specific thing you need to do, but don't try to do things as a rule. What I mean, here it says, select for update, and looks like select for update is bad. No, select for update is wonderful, if you use it wisely. You need to do a select for update when you need it, not just in case. Just in case maybe I modify this row later because I have a complex code that does a lot of things, so all my selects will be for update. No, don't do that, okay? It's the, the same case with select the star. If you do a select the star as a default, when you just need one column, uh, you will retrieve much more information that you actually need. And you will, uh, you, you will not get the benefits from the optimizer. So for example, let's do a select the star for a whole table. And everybody says, okay, this will scan the whole table. It doesn't matter if I do star or if I use just one column. No, it is not true. Because if there's an index on that column and the, x, the index is smaller, the select star will process only that index. If it's not null, that column, it will scan the index. And if the index is one-tenth the size of the table, you will, leave, you will do one-tenth the number of accesses 
So it will be actually faster. Okay? Uh, the same for common usage, aggregate and stage data, combine common data, denormalize. This is also something, it's in theory, we should never denormalize. Well, you, we should never denormalize unless it makes sense to denormalize and we know why and when we are denormalizing, okay? Because precalculation, for example, is denormalizing and you need to precalculate some data. It does not make sense for each and every single report to calculate things that are not going to change. So just keep your uh, uh, data that does not change pre-calculated and that's fine. Also, this one, th this is quite complex. External components that can impact on the DB. Uh, I used to work uh, at a, an uh, e-commerce site and we had, uh, we, we were really very good at caching in the CDN, and the vast majority of the content was caged. Um, and actually, uh, we used also the CDN as a protection against uh, attacks. So usually that's a common pattern is you have static and dynamic. Uh, and then you uh, cage the, the static, and the dynamic uh, comes uh, straight forward to, to, to your website. What we did was a little bit different. Everything was going across the CDN, and we had rules in the CDN based on the URL that decided if that URL was static or was dynamic. The good thing about this is that we could switch from static to dynamic. We could have different time to leave uh, options, so in case of an increase of load, we could say, okay, this component that are now is dynamic will be static just for 10 seconds. And this will relieve part of the load. And it was really very clever and uh, uh, the, the, the CDN was really, we were a, a use case. But the problem with this is from time to time, you need to reset the cache in the CDN just for whatever reason. There's something broken, there's a problem, and when you empty the cache at the CDN for half an hour, you get all the traffic. Each and everything request comes to you until everything is caged again. So until you warm the, the CDN uh, cages. So sometimes you need to understand that these kind of things happen. The caching sometimes needs to be cleaned and everything needs to be reloaded. Okay? This is not a common case, but you need to at least be aware. So for example, don't clean the cage in peak hours. Okay? Also important, if you keep things uh, simple, the, the migration and new releases uh, uh, will be easier, but also migration and new releases mean that some design uh, decisions can change. Okay, if we have a new index, we can, a new index technology, or a new engine at database level, or a new replication option, we can say, okay, what was valid up to today has changed. And then we need to rethink uh, how we apply those changes or how we can benefit from those changes. Know the limitations of your database and infrastructure. If it's a distributed database, you will have a, a, a impact in the case of an incident. The backups, know that backups uh, tend to use a lot of uh, I.O. In general, design for success. Decide before coding what will have 
much more impact on scalability and stability. Because this is something that you will have to leave. It's like marrying. So it's mm, very often it's hard to divorce and it costs you a lot of pain and money. Some failures are easier than others to fix. If a drive fails, you replace it. And fingers crossed, you have backup. If you need a bigger instance, you just buy it. But if your design is uh, not so good, then probably you will need to rebuild it. And that's all. Thank you very much. I think somebody was taking pictures of this slide. So. Thank you very much. <laughs>